Greetings, everybody. We're ready for the Bible study webcast from the North Canton Congregation of the United Church of God. Uh, also, our sister congregations in Youngstown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Wheeling, West Virginia. But we want to welcome you to the Bible study tonight. Uh, I'll uh, get back to introducing it. I need some inspiration first. I think we all do whenever we sit down to study God's Word. So if you'll bow your heads, I'll ask a blessing on the Bible study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of the technology that makes it possible for us to have the, the Bible study and, and send it out on the web and for brethren to connect and listen to it and to watch it. And we just thank you for that, Father. We ask now your inspiration on the delivery. That's the, the, the one wild card where we really need your help and inspiration. Delivery of the message from your word, that it will be clear and understandable. Please bless also the technologies involved here so that it all comes through well. Thank you for the knowledge of your truth and of your way of life. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, once again, welcome to the North Canton uh, Bible Study for the United Church of God. The, the, the title tonight is... I uh, try to find kind of interesting titles or creative titles. Maybe they're not interesting. I don't know. But this one is straight to the point. The night to be much remembered, or sorry, the night to be much observed. It is, some translations say observed, some say remembered. Either way, the concept is the same. I'll tend to use uh, one or the other uh, intermittently through the Bible study tonight. It's important for us to understand this uh, less talked about uh, event and, and uh, ceremony within the Church of God. Uh, we talk about uh, the Passover, of course. We talk about the Days of Unleavened Bread. We talk about Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement. But how often, and the last great day, and we'll forget that, but how often do we think about the night to be much observed? And yet it is an incredible time. An incredible time for us when we understand how it applies to us, but it was an incredible time for Moses and the Israelites when they were in Egypt. So we'll be going through some of the events and, and drawing some lessons from that as we begin here and understand the, uh, in the 20th and 21st century how God called, uh, called us to understand things that the world just doesn't know yet. And yet it's in their Bible. It's in the Bible that is readily available to anybody and everybody, especially via the internet, but in print as well. But they don't understand what it says. But it's only by the grace of God, his calling, his mercy, in, in bringing us to the knowledge of the truth that we understand it. So we'll now begin to look at the, uh, the night to be much observed. Let's start with the symbolism of the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. We need a little background in the New Testament. This is ironic because most of the time we'll be in the Old Testament. But we need the, the background of the New Testament to go further back and look at the Old Testament. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we need to read, well, uh, all the way through verse 15. And I'll comment as we go along. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 1. And here the, it is the Apostle Paul, of course, that was inspired to write 1 Corinthians. It was a letter to the congregation in Corinth in Greece. And Paul's a little upset. Um, he invested an awful lot of energy and pain, often literal pain, in establishing the congregations in the first century A.D., and including the one in Corinth. And he said, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, such Sexual immorality as not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. And there's an exclamation point after wife in most English translations, presumably others as well. You know, it, that's, that's a, that kind of a sin, an ongoing sin, is a horrendous smirch or, or blotch on the reputation of the Church of God. And, and on the the strength of the church, that that would happen. And it goes, because it gets worse. And you are puffed up, which means arrogant. You are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. In other words, it wasn't just the man who was committing the sexual immorality uh, with his presumably stepfather, stepmother, 
but it was the church who said, oh, well, we want to still include him in the Sabbath fellowship. And, you know, we know he's doing that. But, you know, that's just the way it is in Greece, or in Greece these days. Does that sound like today? It should, because that's what goes around today sometimes. You know, we're, kind of, we're in the boots or the sandals. I suppose the Greeks wore sandals because it was warm there as it is today. Uh, we're, in their, we're in their shoes in that sense if we're not careful. Now, Paul, <laughs> Paul slaps them up alongside the head, and we use the term, to get their attention. He says, I, for I indeed, as absent in body, in other words, he wasn't in Corinth at the time. He wrote this letter from one of the other congregations. I believe it was over in Asia Minor, across the Aegean Sea. I, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. And then he gives the, the sentence, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, what he is saying, disfellowship him from the church. He has no business attending the church of God until he repents. And when he repents, truly repents, he can come back. But he's out. He's out now. Paul Cut, cut right through to the, to the core there. Now he goes on, because he's not done with the congregation. They've been sanctioning this man's behavior and, you know, uh, welcoming him to be attending with them, even though he is blatantly committing adultery. He said in verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now we're getting into the symbolism of the days of unleavened bread. I'll explain why in a minute, but we, we understand if you bake at all, or even if you listen to bakers talk about it, that when they are making bread, that is to be light pastry instead of you know crackers like matzos are, they put leavening of some kind of leavening in the dough. When the dough is liquid and they put in the leavening, then it uh, you know makes it lighter and fluffier, puffs it up, as it were. He's using that analogy. Your glorying, he said to the church, is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? How much leaven do you need for a batch of bread that's going to yield you two or three or four loaves, nice loaves of bread? Probably not very much. Tablespoon, maybe two tablespoons at the most of yeast. He goes on to verse 7, Therefore purge out, or clean out, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. For truly you are unleavened, for Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So now we see it's a Passover season. He's using the symbolism of the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread to deal with this problem in the church in Corinth. That's a very marvelous lesson for us. We, we have purged out the old leaven. Theoretically, if we have repented, we've purged out the old sins of our past. And we do have to struggle at times because old habits die hard. But we purge them out and we're, we're determined to root, root them out completely from our lives in the process of growing and overcoming in the, in the true faith. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, uh, but with the leaven of, uh, sorry, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Don't use the old leaven, the old way of thinking, nor with anger and wickedness, but keep the feast of, tab of the unleavened bread with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now you know what unleavened bread is, is pictured. And we're coming up on the, the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread just very shortly, within several weeks. So, so here in 2020, so this is a good lesson for us. Keep the feast with, not with old leaven, but with the with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And by keeping the feast and living our lives with the unleavened bread, that means we're putting sin out of our life. We're overcoming sin. And only the overcomers are going to be in the kingdom of God. Um, now, the lesson for this is the church of God kept the Passover in days of unleavened bread. That's a fundamental point. That's what makes the true church of God completely different than traditional Christianity. Traditional Christianity doesn't care a whit about the days of unleavened bread or the Passover. They keep Easter. And you think, oh, like the Jews. No, not at all like the Jews. 
They don't keep this kind of a Passover. They don't understand the deep spiritual symbolism. There are a few bits that they do know from the Old Testament, but no, it's not the same as the Jew way the Jews do it at all, nor the Messianic Jews. God's church charts its own course directly from the Scripture. Very important for us to understand that. We are not like anybody else, and we're not really interested in blending in with anybody else. As we have a mission of preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God as a witness to the nations. And sometimes that doesn't make friends. And they, it, you know, it's hard to take truth when the truth changes what you've always thought. Now, we're a part of the church of, true church of God in the 21st century. We also keep the days of unleavened bread and the rest of God's annual holy days and the weekly Sabbath. We know that leavening, that leavening in the season of the Passover and the, and the days of unleavened bread is a symbol for sin. It, it's fine to eat the rest of the year, but God tells us for seven days not to eat it, simply for the, the lesson. Now, leavening is going to include sourdough. So if you have sourdough starter, uh, then you have to chuck it out. And you think, well, but I started that, you know, and it took so long to get it going. It'll start again. Same processes are available. It's not that hard. Yeast. So we go through and find any yeast that we have lurking in the back of the cupboard where it fell out of the box. Uh, or baking soda, uh, baking powder, those kinds of things. Any leavening agent that infuses air into the bread. God delineated that, that for one week out of the year that is a symbol for sin. And the... the season we're coming up to is that and contains that week. We therefore comprehend that leavening is a symbol for sin in the sense that it infuses our lives, sin infuses our lives with vanity that leads to more sin. Just like leavening makes the dough rise and infusing air into it. Um, during the days of unleavened bread, you'll hear sermons about this and the meaning of the days of, of the, the two holy days. And we talk about it constantly in that time of the year, because, partly because we're getting our recipe book out of unleavened, unleavened breads uh, to cook at the time and to marvel at how the difference between flat and fluffy is. Uh, doesn't change the flavor, though. The flavor is wonderful. So Paul was talking about that, the time leading up to Passover. This is, uh, let's look at the events now that led to the original Passover as we come to understand the night to be much observed. Now, the night to be much observed is the night that Israel went out of Egypt. We'll get to that. Now, let's, let's walk through that. And it has its counterpart in the way we observe it today. Let's go to Exodus now and look at some really fascinating things that were ha transpiring when Moses came back from being a sheep rancher for 40 years. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and told Pharaoh, you know, God had talked with Moses, to Moses had talked with Aaron, and then they went to talk to Pharaoh. And he told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And I try to read in the Bible and wonder, when, when, what was Moses' reaction? I, I suspect that he didn't expect the first try to work uh, because he had been among Pharaoh's family. He probably knew that Pharaoh reasonably well. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. And, and he had. And please let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall on us with pestilence or with sword. You know, they were, that was the, they were requesting. And Pharaoh says, Get out of here as we use the, the term today, get out of here. And then he told his, his aides, he said, these Israelites don't have enough to do. Make them collect straw to make the bricks that they're supposed to make. They mixed straw into the mud, and they made you know, mud bricks that they used for building. 
So in Exodus chapter 5, we continue in verse 4. So the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Go back to your labor. And he said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor when they come to, to talk to Pharaoh. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters and the people and their officers, saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick. Let them go gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. Now, bear in mind that the Egyptians had made captives out of all of the of the Israelites and, and all of Israel lived in Egypt at that time they were slave people they weren't originally they were there as the honored family members of Joseph hundreds of years before but with time and events things changed and the Egyptians decided to enslave this foreign family or foreign nation that was growing within their midst and get some work out of them. And so then they, they became a slave race for a long period of time. Now that slavery is about to end. In verse 10, as the, And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get yourselves straw where you can find it, yet none of your work will be reduced. You're going to have to work longer, harder, and faster. So the people were scattered abroad throughout the land of Egypt to gather straw, st a stubble instead of straw. And as the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, Fulfill your work, your daily quota, as when there was straw, also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had sent over them, were beaten and asked, Why have you not fulfilled your task, making brick yesterday and today as before? So they began to beat the supervisors because the people couldn't match the quota that needed to be done when they had to gather their own straw and make the bricks. You know, it was a catch-22, and it was just an excuse for beating on the slaves. Now, the Israelites, you might note here, were scattered widely in Egypt to find straw. Therefore, before the exodus can take place, they will need to be gathered again so that they all go out at the same time. Uh, the ten plagues were to be very handy in doing that. The Israelites then complained to Moses. Here, Moses had brought hope. Maybe we can be free and we can be our own nation and we can move away from Egypt. Uh, that hope was shattered. So we know this in verse, chapter 5, verse 15. The officers of the children of the Exodus, chapter 5, and verse 15. The officers of the children of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing with us, your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, and they say to us, Make brick, and indeed your servants are beaten, but the fault is your own people. And he said, You are idle. Idle. This is what Pharaoh responds. Therefore, you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, you now go and, go and work, for no straw will be given you, and you will deliver the same quota of bricks. When the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble, after it was said, You shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. Now, sometimes we have cried out and complained that we have to keep God's Sabbath, holy days, and other aspects of God's way of life uh, that irritates our employers. And there's kind of a side lesson that you can notice there. The Israelites ultimately had to persevere and act in faith, and so do we. But uh, this, this is an important time as we're building up to the night to be much observed. You know, this, we're not there yet, but we're coming to it. The Israelites complained to Moses then about keeping God's way. In chapter 5, it goes on in verse 15, and the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, Why are you dealing with your servants this way? And, uh, hold it, did I read all that? I think I did. Oh, yes. Therefore, go now, and there's no straw will be given you, and you've got to still fulfill the quota. Sometimes we've cried out and complained to God when we have troubles that we face as well. Now let's go to verse 20. Then they came from Pharaoh, just as they were coming out from meeting with Pharaoh, whatever was the main office building that Pharaoh met, met people in at that time. They ran into Moses and Aaron. 
This is in verse 20. Who stood there to meet them, and they said to them, Let the Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Yeah, obviously, they were not happy. They were not encouraged by their meeting with the Pharaoh at all. Because they were coming up against the, the ways of the world. Pharaoh was typical of that. Bear in mind, this is a true event, true history. But God weaves lessons through true history because he oversees history. Let's go to uh, chapter 5, verse 22 now. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? Moses was still focused a lot on Moses. That was going to change, by the way. Just like it, if we focus still a lot on ourselves, that needs to change too. Uh, the days of unleavened bread and the Passover are all about positive spiritual change. Overcoming is what that's called. How often do we complain to God? How often do we doubt our calling into the true faith of Jesus Christ? You know, how do you dump that kind of doubt? Well, you stay close to God in prayer and believe him and claim his promises to provide and protect. And he'll do that. I mean, he did it for the Israelites. And he's done it for his other servants in the Bible. And past performance projects forward to future performance, what God will do for us as well in this age as we need it. Now, let's move to chapter 6 of Exodus, and uh, we'll talk about the ten plagues briefly. Uh, then in verse 1, 1 through 8 actually, to begin with, the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. And when we really read that, we said, okay, God knew Pharaoh wasn't going to let them go to right off the bat. Exactly. You know, he knew, he knew Pharaoh inside and out, just like he knows us inside and out, doesn't he? For with a strong hand, he will let them go, and with a strong hand, he will drive them out of the land. But where were the slave people going to get a strong hand to do that? that would make Pharaoh actually want them to leave. Well, the ten plagues came in next, uh, in chapter 6 of Exodus. This gives us a little inkling of how God moved things, and how God can move and change dynamics in our lives today, if we humble ourselves before him and seek that direction and guidance. So he sent the ten plagues, one after another. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Exodus. And the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, I am the Eternal. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage. He God had made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the land of Canaan, which they knew as the promised land, would be the promised land for their descendants. Now, this is several centuries down the line, but God doesn't forget his promises, and he fulfills his promises in the time frame that he planned, sometimes we think he should fulfill his promises quicker. Uh, but God also wants to build in us the character of patience and faith. So there has to be waiting time at various times in our lives. That's one of the great lessons of the Days of Unleavened Bread. We're overcoming sin and learning to be patient and keep striving, keep working at doing what we need to do to be faithful to God and, and to be obedient to him and know that God will provide as needed. So we go on. God spoke to Moses, and this is in verse 2, I am the Eternal. I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and as God Almighty. Establish my covenant with them. And then we come down to verse 5, jump down to verse 5. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. I worked with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've been working with you, Moses and Aaron, and now I'm going to work all of Israel. 
I've been watching, I can hear what's going on, and I can see what's going on. Therefore, he said, say to the children of Israel, this is what I want you to take back as a message. Say to them, I am the Eternal, and I will bring you out, uh, I am the Lord or the Eternal, I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments. You, know, you stop and think about that. What does that mean? We've got outstretched arm. That means strength. Great judgments. That means, you know, come up it's time. Uh, punishment for those who are evil. And, and bondage is going to come to an end. That's actually good news. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Yeah, that's pretty strong encouragement from our creator then you shall know that i am the eternal your god who brought you out of the bur uh, out from under the burdens of the egyptians the burdens of the egyptians the slave treatment and the slavery that they labored away in generation after generation with no hope of ever getting out of it and i will bring you into the land which i swore to give to abraham isaac and jacob and i will give it to you as a heritage i am the eternal God says, in essence, Israel is coming out of Egypt, and I'm going to make it happen. And he was telling that to Moses, and, and Moses then was going to try to communicate that effectively to the others. Now we go on to verse 9, here in chapter 6. So Moses spoke this to the children of Israel, but they didn't heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. You know, they were... They were sore beset, as the term has sometimes been used in America, sore beset uh, with the troubles. And they, they faced troubles on their own, but you know, the Egyptians were enslaving them and troubling them and treating them unfairly and harshly. You know, they were lucky just to even be alive at that time. Now Moses was bolstered a bit. He was strengthened and encouraged. So he keeps warning Pharaoh to let Israel go, but Pharaoh keeps rejecting Moses' request. Now we will skim over and just make a reference here to Exodus 7 to 10 covers the 10 plagues of Egypt. Actually, the first nine of the 10 plagues from chapter 11 to uh, chapter 7 to chapter 10. Chapters 11 and 12 deal with the 10th plague which, as you remember, is the death, the very famous plague of the death of the firstborn. It's nice that we have an old film, actually a very fine, well-produced film, called The Ten Commandments that goes through some of this. It doesn't get everything precisely right, but it gets the, the story flow pretty accurate. Now we come down to chapter 12, from 1 to 28. What, uh, we'll summarize what it says there. That through Moses, God institutes the Passover sacrifice. And he describes the Passover lambs that were to be slaughtered between sundown and dark, that is, between the evenings in the King James Version. Um, when the sun goes down, you have a half hour, typically, a half hour of light to be able to see and do things. And then after the half hour is gone, then you can't, you know, it's dark. So that's the, the between the evenings. Sundown ended the day, but it's still light enough to see to do things. Um, people who go hunting in America will understand that because typically for most seasons, except for uh, game birds, uh, and yeah, mostly game birds, it's, it's uh, for deer hunting and things like that, you have till a half hour after sunset. And then when a half hour comes up, finishes, then it's too dark to see to shoot safely, and so you have to stop. Well, that's the time of between the evenings of that passage. That would be when the lamb was slaughtered for the Passover sacrifice in the days of Moses. And they took the they, so they had set aside the lambs, and you go back and read carefully through chapter twelve. They set the lamb aside four days before the Passover. So on the tenth, the Passover would be on the fourteenth day of that month. And so they would take it on the 10th day, they would set it aside. We're going to use this one for our family and your family together because they were small families. We can, even just, we can eat the same lamb together. We'll do it in one house. And that, that is all allowed for in this particular passage. 
and in the way that uh, they were to observe the Passover. And then they would take some of the blood of the lamb and plant it on the doorpost and on the lintels, the cross piece on the doorpost uh, of each home where the, past, the Israelites were keeping the Passover. Then the death angel would not go into that house. That was marking off this is a, a house of faith. And they would go and kill the firstborn in the other houses of the Egyptians rather than the Israelites. But if the Israelites didn't follow that, they would lose their firstborn too. Now we look at the events of Passover night. This would be the 14th of Nisan or Abib, um, as it, uh, the, word, the, the name of the month is variously spelled. Exodus 12, verse 29. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. So this was the firstborn of all the families in Egypt. That means that if the husband was the firstborn, the wife was the firstborn, and they had children, there would be at least three deaths in the house. Any firstborn, no matter how old they were, died. And at midnight, that, the death angel came through and did that. And from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, Pharaoh lost his firstborn, too. If you remember watching the Ten Commandments, that's quite dramatically portrayed yeah, in, in that movie. And uh, it included the, the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. It was a horrendous plague. I mean, they had a lot of other plagues that were very bad. But this one really capped them off. Because suddenly you had what healthy animals you were able to save from the deadly hailstorms and other things. Uh, you lost a certain percentage of them. Any, any uh, beef or, or sheep that was a firstborn, the firstborn of its mother, died. No matter if it was little or if it was fully grown and maybe even old. Same with the horses, same with the cattle, same with all of the people. There is Israel, the Egyptians, and all their various strata of, you know, layers of citizenship of the Egyptians. But it didn't happen to the Israelites. That was a remarkable thing. Now here's the reaction of what happened in verse 30. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was not a great cry in Egypt, for there was not, not a house not a single house where there was a, not one dead, at least one. You stop to think, and when, when, when you read of these sorts of situations, brethren, apply your imagination to thinking about what that must have been like and the impact that that would have had on Egypt as a nation and on the people there. Now, at Tenth Plague, the death of the firstborn takes place during that nighttime portion of the day, it happens while the Israelites are keeping the Passover meal. Now, the Passover of the Old Testament was eaten through the night. And they would have been doing that, and they would have been hearing the anguish cries of any household that was within earshot of where they lived uh, during the course of the night when they found who, one of, whoever was the firstborn had died possibly at the table or, or uh, while talking to the rest of the family and just drop dead. You imagine the, the anguish and the drama uh, and the agony that Egypt was going through. But then Israel had been going through an awful lot of that same agony for a couple of hundred years by that time as slaves. First they weren't slaves, then they were made into slaves. Now, let's look at the events that transpire from then on, the events of the night to be much observed. So we have, we've got the Passover, and the reason it's called Passover, that was when the firstborn died, but the death angel would pass over the house that had the blood of the lamb painted on the lentils and the doorpost of the house. It would pass over those, those homes and go to the homes that didn't have that, who were not trying to obey God, and typically, therefore, were not Israelites, although there would have been some who paid attention, there always are, some non-Israelites who were perhaps also slaves or maybe even Egyptians that thought the Israelites were getting a bad deal and, you know, 
had some concern for them. Undoubtedly, there was some like that. That's the, way, the course of human nature. So notice in verse 31, uh, this is after the death of the firstborn in Exodus 12, verse 31 to 42. We're going to read that now. Then he, that Pharaoh is the he here, then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and go from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go and serve the Lord as you have said, and take your flocks and herds and your herds as you have said, and be gone. And notice the ending of the sentence, and bless me also. Uh, so it looks like Pharaoh had become a believer of sorts by the end of this ordeal. And bless me also. He sent the messengers to Moses and Aaron. They didn't go to him that night. He sent the messengers with this message. And, and to bless him as well. So now Israel could leave. But they were to have some benefit. Bear in mind they had been slaves for at least 200 years, maybe, maybe more. For a time, they plundered the Egyptians as a type of back pay for their slave labor. In verse 33, the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. Now, it's a fairly logical conclusion that they would come to after the death of the firstborn and the devastating hailstorms and the river turned to blood and the flies and the frogs and all of the other horrendous things that they had happen to them, uh, they were sure that they were going to die unless these people leave. They've actually come to that conviction. And in verse 34, so the people, the Israelites, took their dough before it was leavened, their bread dough, and you couldn't go down to a supermarket to buy bread in those days, especially if you were slaves. Uh, you had to make your own. So they took, and they didn't have packages of yeast or baking soda like we have today, which we have to get rid of for the days of unleavened bread. They used uh, basically the sourdough starter of uh, the yeast in the air infusing the bread uh, and then ultimately being the sourdough that would be spread used from one batch to the next, saving back some for that sourdough process. That was their leavening of the time. And they took their, they had their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. And now the children of Israel, verse 35, had done according to the word of Moses. As the plagues got worse, they had been doing this. They had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given people, the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. It didn't mean they went charging into the house and snatching things. They were asking for back pay for all of the slave labor that they had uh, performed on behalf of the Egyptian nation. And as the plagues got worse, the people weren't the, the Egyptian people were not as tough-minded as Pharaoh was. They were stubborn, uh, might be a better term. Uh, they would have been happy for them to leave. They were happy to get them out of the country now. So the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, um, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. So that would, if you translate that into overall population, it would be two and a half to three million people that were on the move at one time. That's a huge wagon train. Two and a half to three million people. And a mixed multitude in verse 38 went up with them also and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. So you had the Oregon Trail, which uh, had the Conestoga wagons, and the wagons were pulled by oxen or horses, varying variously, and there were some cattle and other horses that were taken along with by the, the people. Uh, this would have made that such our wagon trains of the time look small. Uh, I don't know if you've studied the Oregon Trail or not. It used to go through between uh, when I was small in Nebraska, a youngster. It uh, went between our milk house and our barn. That's the route of the Oregon Trail. And then went right down our to our farm. And at the edge of the neighbor's farm and our farm, there was a ford in the North Platte River. And they would ford the river at that point as they were on their way, continuing on their way west. Between 50,000 and 90,000 Americans 
moved out on the Oregon Trail all during the it was 20 or 22 years that the Oregon Trail was active in the 1840s until the middle, the early 1860s. Uh, that they had between 50,000 and 90,000 estimated numbers of people moving across uh, the America. With the Egyptian, with the Israelites leaving, you had two and a half million or so that were going to. This was a big wagon train, really big wagon train, all at one time, not stretched out one wagon train behind another, you know, a part of a day's walk ahead. Verse 37, then the children of Israel journeys from Ramesses to Sukkot. As I said, 600,000 men is besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them, so they had more even than that. These would have been Gentiles, non-Israelites, who also were probably slaves, or maybe some of the Egyptians, because uh, it's better to be an Israelite than an Egyptian. They may have come to that conclusion. Went with them also in flocks and herds and the livestock, and they baked unleavened cakes. Uh, they didn't have time for the leavening to sink in, as I had, had talked about earlier, and, uh, and nor had they prepared provisions for themselves, so they had to cook on the run. In verse 40, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, that would have been the very same day, that they had come down into Egypt with Joseph or with Jacob came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of solemn observance, or as we call it, the night to be much observed or the night to be much remembered. <coughs> you wonder, well, which is it? And observed or remembered? It can be either one. As if you're observing it, you're remembering it. If you're remembering it, you're observing it. The concept is, is the same. It was a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children throughout their generations. Children of Israel throughout their generations. Now, this is the night to be much remembered or to much observed, as we refer to the term. So we keep the night to be much observed at the beginning of the first day of unleavened bread. By say at the beginning, I mean in the evening after sundown, you know, the initially the Passover is kept on the 14th day and it began to be kept after sundown on the 14th of Nisan or the 14th of uh, what was the other name for Nisan? Nisan will be fine for now. And when that day was over, that was the end of the Passover. It began at sundown and it went through the daytime and it ended at sundown. As that sun was going down, then came what we now know as the first day of unleavened bread, one of God's annual holy days. That was the day that he sent Israel out of Egypt, was on that day. And they started at night. So they were gathering in where they lived, in Goshen, and they were starting to form their massive wagon train, for want of a better term, to move out of the land. They weren't going to move very fast because they were carrying a lot of heavy loot, gold and silver and other precious things that the Egyptians had, you know, pressed upon them. Here, take this, you know, when they looted the Egyptians. You know, that's not enough. Take some more and don't come back. Uh, that was a night to be much remembered, the night to be much observed. We write the initials usually when we're writing to, about it, NTBMO, night to be much observed or NTBMR, not to be much remembered, either one works. But it's the beginning of the first day of unleavened bread. It's part of a holy day now. And we reflect on how God called us out of the world and into the truth of his word, into his true church of God. Before, we might have been faithful Christians, but we didn't know the true faith. We didn't know the truth. When God revealed the truth to us through his way of calling us, hearing the gospel preached, meeting somebody that believed the truth already, and then asking them questions, becoming intrigued as God was starting to work with, them, with the individual's mind, then we were ready to finally make the commitment. Here we have the slave people of the Israelites. Their commitment was made. With God encouraged them through the the difficulties with Pharaoh, the ten plagues that he sent upon Egypt, 
encourage them some more, especially after they stopped experiencing the plagues themselves at a certain point midway through, then the plague only affected where the Egyptians were and it didn't affect the Israelites. Initially, they were affected uh, as well, which was good. Helped them to realize what the, the seriousness that God had. Now, we, again, just re reviewing this, verse 40 of uh, Exodus, uh, was it 12, I guess. Now, the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. We read that. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very day, God timed it just exactly what, the way he wanted to. It came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of solemn observance. That's the night to be much remembered. Now, it's the beginning of a holy day. So in the daylight portion of the day, because they left at night, at the daylight portion of the day, that's when we observe the holy day and the meaning of the holy day that the man in 1 Corinthians had forgotten and the rest of the, some of the rest of the congregation had forgotten too. But we observe the night to be much observed the evening before that. It marks ourselves coming to the knowledge of the truth. Coming to the conviction, I need to live this way of life. I see it's here in the Bible. I am understanding it. I've been studying about, I've got to start living this. I've got to begin to keep the Sabbath. And I'm not going to eat any more pork sausage anymore. And you, you know the list of things. If you can think back, for those who have been in the church a long time, that's a long time to think back. But those who are newer, you still remember very, very clearly things that you pushed out of your life because they were sinful whether it was diet, whether it was behavior, uh, you didn't work on the Sabbath anymore. You got a job, either you negotiated with the boss to not have to work on the Sabbath, or you got a job that didn't require you to work on the Sabbath. You'd be, you had to keep God's Sabbath holy. And you got time off for the holy days, and sometimes that was a trial of faith as well. But that was foreshadowed by what the Israelites had been going through here. Now, Let's drop back here to the New Testament era. Uh, a review of the Passover regulations in verse 43 uh, of, of the Exodus there. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. This is in uh, chapter 12 and verse 43. No foreigner shall eat the Passover. In the New Testament era, only baptized members may take the Passover, not even our children. And they, well, why can't they have a little sip of wine? They're not converted yet. They have not, they have not repented and received God's Holy Spirit. They have not come to that point of faith and conviction at a personal level, which requires a, ma a mature mind to make. They have to grow up. That's why we do it this way, because this is how God said for it to be done. And God knows what he's doing far better than do we. Let me go on. Uh, there would be collateral growth of Israel. Notice this, verse 44. Um, said that It said in verse 43, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of the Passover. That meant the Passover lamb, uh, which was the way Passover was kept then. For now, we don't use the lamb. We use the, the sip of wine, representing Christ's shed blood, and the piece of broken uh, unleavened bread to picture the broken body of Christ. Uh, just very specifically as Jesus himself said for us to take the Passover. That's why we don't do it in the Old Testament way. But every man's servant who is brought for money when he, have, this is verse 44, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. When he is, you know, when he, uh, there's a servant, maybe he started out as a slave, the slavery was there, or you hired him or something. Uh, but he decided to convert and become an Israelite. Then he had to be circumcised if it was a man. Uh, and then he could eat the Passover with the family. He was part of the family then, in a sense, the spiritual part of the family as they understood it. Verse 45, a sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. Eating the Passover, or in our case, eating the tiny piece of broken unleavened bread and taking the tiny sip of wine, representing the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, is only to be done by those who have committed themselves to follow God's way and have, been, have come to true repentance and been baptized and received the laying on of hands and received God's Spirit. 
you know, there's the process of conversion. So if in ancient Israel, if there was a servant who lived with an Israelite family and he decided that this was the right way to live, which undoubtedly that happened numerous times, then he would have to be circumcised as that was the, the uh, ceremony of the Old Testament. And then he could then eat that Passover with them and be counted as an Israelite in that sense. In verse 45, a sojourner and a hired servant, however, they won't eat it because they, they aren't following the God of Israel. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry the, any of the flesh outside the house. That's for the, the Passover lamb. It has to be eaten. Nor shall you break one of its bones. Christ's bones were not broken. This is the foreshadowing of that. All the congregation shall keep it. And when a stranger who dwells with you wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, as he becomes to understand the religion of Israel, it's so far better than the pagan religions, let his, all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. See, God doesn't discriminate. He, he, God is a God of opportunity and truth. And if you want to believe the truth, there's a world of opportunity in God's way of life. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So there has to be the commitment to keeping the Passover uh, in, this, in this sense. And this was part of the night to be much observed, was the beginning of this whole process. Now, just adding a little bit more. In the New Testament era, baptism or, and conversion... Uh, what, the conversion takes place. Baptism is being, after you've personally repented, then you are immersed in a ceremony, uh, accepting Christ as your personal Savior, Lord and Master, your high priest in heaven, and soon coming King. And then when you come up out of the water, which doesn't take that long, you just have to be submerged, and then you lift it up. Uh, then the minister will lay hands on the head of that person in a, in a prayer. Everybody bows their head and listens to the prayer. Asking God to impart his Holy Spirit into that mind and into that life. And that person then is converted because that's when you receive the Holy Spirit. Well, this was, this was the forerunner of that is what Israel did. Because they weren't generally converted. There were only the few that had God's Holy Spirit in ancient Israel. Mostly the prophets and a few others, just a select few. God was not calling all of Israel at that time or all, uh, you know, even as many as the church has. At that time, it was going, it was much fewer. He'll call them later, though. Of course, that's a whole other story, and we get into another day of one of God's annual holy days, and we'll save that for another time. Now, in verse 50, thus all the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did, and it came to pass that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. Get the next page of notes here. This brings us then to a symbol, just a summary of the symbolism of the, uh, uh, the night to be much observed, or night to much, much remembered, as it is called. It's the night to be much observed celebrates our calling out of the world and into God's way in his true church. That's why we have a gathering with brethren to enjoy a meal and spiritual fellowship and reflect on the calling that God has given us. Uh, Israel would have reflected on the history they were told of, about Israel coming out of Egypt. We reflect on our personal histories and, and the history of God's true church uh, during the days of the uh, night to be much observed. Night to be much observed is a commanded assembly in that sense. That we are to be together with some others, if at all possible, and to have a special meal and savor that day. It isn't as formal a ceremony as the Passover is, but it is still a, a meal of thanksgiving. Spiritual thanksgiving is contrasted to America's Thanksgiving Day, which is great, a great holiday for America. Night to be much remembered, again, in that sense, is commanded for us each year. The event, uh, it pictures as the Exodus. That was the commanded assembly. Uh, thus, likewise, the night to be much remembered is the commanded assembly as well. Because the exodus is leaving Egypt. And that was the night that it happened. And that was then going to be foreshadowed on an individual basis when a person repents of his sins and chooses 
to leave that way behind him and start to follow God's way in the New Testament era, which we're still in right now. So it is a commanded assembly with the caveat here in 2020 about the coronavirus concerns. Some of us may end up commemorating the night to be much remembered at home, uh, possibly even alone. But that doesn't change the meaning of the day and the meaning of the ceremony. And if that ends up being your case, then go ahead and give God thanks for all of his wonderful calling out of this present evil world that we're in to be a part of his true church. And we begin to focus on his great kingdom. It's a time of spiritual rejoicing and thanksgiving. Let's look in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we draw this to a conclusion here. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58. Now, this is the resurrection chapter, so we're picking up on the sort of the conclusion of it, the summary and the glory of what it means to be resurrected and realize that in a sense being called completely called out of the world ultimately is finished when we are resurrected uh, when Christ returns. So it's 1 Corinthians 50, 15 verses 50 to 58. Now this I say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God neither nor does corruption or, you know, the corruption being the fact that we decompose when we die, uh, inherit incorruption, which means we don't decompose at all. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, this is talking about the resurrection, but the principle applies to being called into the church as well. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now, that is fulfilled on the Feast of Trumpets, but it's the concept of that that has that has an application right back to the night to be much remembered or the night to be much observed. That's our ultimate exodus from uh, this world and its ways, but we have our own personal exodus when we repent and begin to live God's way of life. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and the process takes place during our life. And this mortal must put on immortality. That takes place with the resurrection. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It's kind of interesting how the Feast of Trumpets, which pictures the resurrection time, uh, and when we're resurrected, when Christ returns, how the Feast of Trumpets has a connection back to the night to be much remembered. There's a, the, the similar principles that are taking, taking place. It goes on and finishes it this way. And, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, or grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's the fall holy days, typified here by the Feast of Trumpets, which the resurrection occurred on that, or the spring holy days, with the night to be much of word observed when we began our journey to the resurrection, when we repented of our sins and came out of the world that way. It's fascinating how God's holy days connect and, and shadow uh, one of another. The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our conclusion is this, the night to be much remembered is celebrates, celebrated ancient Israel's exodus from Egypt. And the night to be much remembered today pictures, or in that sense celebrates, not in the wild, silly sense of society so much, but it celebrates our personal exodus from sin and from the ways of this present evil world, even though we have to live in it until Christ returns. But we choose to live God's way of life, and the night to be much remembered is the fact that now we know it. Now we are living it. Now we have committed ourselves to it. Now we are looking forward to the coming of Christ and the kingdom of God uh, to be on earth at that time. So hope that you have a wonderful uh, Day, night to be much re observed or night to be much remembered or as many people just refer it night to be I, I think you should tack observed or remembered one of those two words on to night to be so we always know what we're doing what we're process of doing and uh, savor these wonderful spring holy days are coming I want you to I want to thank you for joining us for the bible study tonight and we'll be having another one here in just a few weeks 
So uh, the email announcement will come out for that. In the meantime, uh, stay away from the coronavirus if at all possible and savor the coming Sabbath day. Thanks for being with us.